All right, so I want to welcome everybody to uh, to the ideation forum today, uh, July 10th. We're going to have uh, Nick from Smarter Building Systems presenting about basalt and and, and the dozens of of applications uh, for basalt. The uh, the main focus of his presentation is going to be around rebar and construction material, but there are dozens and dozens of applications. Uh, we're going to have a few additional presentations to to target those different industries, those different applications, and and go into them in more detail. But I did want to uh, to allow him to have the the second slot as well to uh, to highlight some of that because. I want the the community to be aware of all of these potential applications. Be able to to share this with people within their communities and at their organizations that might be might be interested and 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 may want to attend. So so just to go over a few other things uh, with the uh, with the forum, just some updates. So we're on YouTube, obviously. Talk about that every week. Uh, the file repository is accessible through the website and that has the the videos where you can download them you can only view them on YouTube uh, and also it has the presentations summaries invitations all that stuff there so that has all the files and recordings that that anyone would need uh, again want to hear from you so you know please provide topics of interest I actually have two requests so people that are out there uh, that are in the community that are here or watch the video, uh, we have a request for uh, robotics. So robots that are focused to warehousing operations. And the other one is around integrated circuit chip design. Uh, there are There's interest in being able to, to harden chips so I would like uh, connections to to people that are doing IC design, whether it's within your organization at the un your university or someone within your your connections. We'd appreciate that. As always, you know, share your challenges, solutions, and any feedback you have about the uh, the forum. I'm not muted, so it's just you. I think everybody else can hear me because I've been talking with uh, Jeremy. I've been talking with Nick. Can, Nick, can you hear me? I can. Thank you. Okay. And yeah. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you, everybody else. For I'm not joining. yet. Nope. I'm not done yet. I just want somebody chimed in oh. and said that they they couldn't hear anything, so I wanted to make sure. Oh. Okay. All right. So um, a couple of things I wanted to address is I sent out the invitation. I know that the invitation is is at length. Um, I do this on purpose because I want people to be able to see. Uh, what is planned for future presentations so that they can plan uh, which uh, which presentations they want to attend. Uh, this is mostly because we're open topic. And as you can see with with the list that's coming up in the future, we've got, you know, fusion grade magnets coming up. We're going to talk about uh, genetically edited uh, citrus trees, which is basically it's not um, GMO genetically modified where they're changing where they're adding. It's actually a sub subtractive process. So so you can see that that the topics vary. Uh, we also have blockchain, things like that. What I'm wanting to know is do people read this? So if you can just put it in the chat, do you go through the whole the whole um, invitation or do you just read the top? Uh, the other thing I'm looking at too is the um, I had in here the the list of planned presentations that haven't been scheduled yet, the planned topics that haven't been scheduled yet. I'm thinking about deleting this part because it does take up a lot of space, and I have not been getting any response from people that have questions about what is planned but not scheduled, and that was in there so that if someone had an immediate need, they could reach out to me and and. Say, hey, you know, who is this? What are they doing? So please go ahead and put in the chat your thoughts on on the invitation, its length, what I have in there, what I don't have in there. I would appreciate that. 
And with that, I believe, oh, one last thing, uh, two last things. So update, every day I update, or every week I update. So we're up to 276 potential relationships that are in various stages of development that we've identified with 32 presentations on this forum. So thank you for everybody that participates, everybody that shares their their connections and, and shares the uh, solutions that, that we are presenting here. I appreciate it. And the presenters definitely appreciate it. The, uh, the last thing is email addresses. So if you do participate in the conversations and you do comment or, or have a potential application, uh, please put your email address in the chat. If it's not entered when you, when you, join the session i don't uh i don't want to force people to hold on a second i don't want to force people to sign up or or give their email address if they don't want to but i may have to if i can't do the follow-up which is what's happening I'm, I'm having people that that comment or have questions and then they don't actually give me a point of contact that i can follow up and and that is the biggest part of what we do here is not only do we present the topics and identify the relationships, but but here within the community, we also drive those um, relationships forward. So we need to make those connections. We need to have those those email phone numbers so that we can reach out after the presentation and put everybody together to to make these innovations happen because that's what needs to happen, what needs to be done. So with that, I'm gonna look in the chat and okay. So Sunil, you have a question for me, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering what uh, this meeting was about and what are your goals? All right, so what we do is, is let, me, let, me, let me think about this for just one second here. So the idea, is that innovation is generally stovepiped. Uh, so what we're trying to, what happens is if you take a bunch of subject matter experts together and you try and innovate, all you're doing is bringing up what's already known. You're, you're just rehashing, patting each other on the back for all the wonderful things that you've done and, and, and how good you've built it. And there's really nothing more that you can do. So to truly innovate, you, you need perspective. So the idea of this is to find new, novel, and obscure solutions, technologies, capabilities, and also to present challenges to a broad community across many sciences, many industries, many sectors. Uh, by doing that, we bring in a whole slew of perspective and Nick is going to talk about basalt, and this is a perfect example. Basalt applies to two dozen industries at least. It, it can be used in, in medical industry for making prosthetics. It can be used in the marine industry for uh, making boats, construction, for buildings, uh, fire retardants, uh, insulation, uh, aerodynamics, space applications, composites, it just goes on and on and on. And if, if Nick was only presenting to construction, then he would only get construction solutions. So by opening this up to everybody, we identify new applications for what Nick is going to talk about within other industries that that people may not have thought about because their focus is on a specific industry. If I build robots for the manufacturing industry, I may not see the connection where my robots would fit in the medical industry or the mining industry or, or in warehousing or whatever. So those are the connections that we try to make. Those, that's, what, that's why we call these ideation forums because we're trying to ideate to find new solutions, new applications. And then the next step is we capture all of that and we want to drive it forward because the other thing I've seen with innovation is it stagnates. Uh, people get all excited about it in the beginning, but then it kind of dies off and people lose interest or they just 
to bit off more than they could chew or they really don't know what the next step is or they don't have the resources. And so we want to solve all of those challenges. So I hope that answers your question thoroughly. <laughs> sort of. <laughs> is this a is this a government entity or are you an independent um, organization that in includes government as well as industry? So I started, I, I, worked, I worked for the federal government. I was a civilian employee. I worked for the Navy and I developed a, what I called the presentation and ideation forum for the federal government. The goal of that was to identify new novel obscure technologies, present them to the broader federal government and come up with applications within the federal government that solved solutions or solved challenges that they had. Uh, we did this for seven months. We did 52 presentations. We set up over 400 collaborations. Um, I worked for the Navy. My funding was from the Navy, but the application was federal. And so when I wanted additional funds to track all of these collaborations that we were building, when the Navy came in and took a look at it, they said, wait a minute, why are we paying for this? when we're only getting a 10% a benefit and the go federal government in a whole is getting 90% and they pulled my funding. So I went ahead, uh, I saw the value that it had. So I went ahead and retired and chose to, uh, to launch a commercial venture that was uh, more open and more comprehensive. And, and yes, um, so I, I work, you put in quantum there. We, we will have a, a presentation on quantum coming up um, I'm, I work with uh, Southern Methodist University and the Darwin Deason Institute of Cyber and and quantum computing. So so we will be having them present on quantum computing in the future. I'm just trying to uh, to schedule that now. Well, uh, you can put me down for FPGA design if you'd like and okay. uh, quantum computing and quantum materials. That'd be great. So right. so yeah, if you can put your email in so that I can contact you after this. I would appreciate it. Sure. And and like I said, I mean, we, we it's an open topic. So there are very few topics that are off limits. Obviously, we we can't discuss classified projects within the military, those kind of things. But we're working to resolve that uh, with a, uh, a federal only forum that would be on a JWIX platform. All right, so with all of that, Thank you for uh, for letting me steal some of your time, Nick. Okay. Um, one more thing, no Willis. Problem. You on your Willis Williams? You're unmuted. Did you have a question? Oh uh, yeah, I was going to ask uh, on the JWix uh, option. How how far out do you think that is? Somebody needs to identify the money. So I'm talking with AFRL, SOCOM, OUSD, RE, but no one has been able to. They all want it. No one's been able to find the funds, um, and it, it. We were talking about every other week, so it would be less than 200k a year to fund that. So okay. I was going to start a push here shortly to try and capture some sweep up money to to get that implemented. But I just basically need a sponsor. Okay. I have access. I, ha I have an agreement. I'm in Tampa. I have an agreement with uh, with the director of S and T. At uh, at SOCOM, uh, she we have a crata. I have access to a skiff whenever I need it. All right, thanks. All right, thank you. Okay, so with that, I am going to turn this over to Nick, and I am going to let Nick talk about the uh, the many uses of basalt. So I've got to turn off my camera here and share Nick's presentation. Give me a second here. And go ahead, Nick. Thank you, Eugene, and thank you all for joining. Um, I became involved in basalt volcanic rock products about 15 years ago um, after having been in the construction industry for a long time. And um, it started with my discovery of a basalt rebar. Uh, basalt is a volcanic rock, as you all know, um, but only certain basalts mines and ores uh, qualify in order to be able to make it into a fiber. They have mineral content that has to fall within the right parameters. 
you know, you can't have too much iron or this or that in the, in order to be able to pull it into a filament, just like you would fiberglass or carbon fiber. Uh, we melt the rocks at 1800 degrees and they get pulled through these platinum rhodium, what they call bushings. And that drops a filament that gets sprayed with a, what they call a sizing of silanes. And then that filament is wound just like you would make, again, a fiberglass or a Kevlar or a carbon, but from all rock. And with all the properties of rock, uh, many of which are superior in many aspects uh, to petroleum-based or carbon-based chemistries. Um, but so we're calling it, uh, getting back to Earth, the new Stone Age, <laughs> because there are so many applications for it. Uh, we'll start. Um, if you want to take care of it, and get it done tonight or tomorrow. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm hearing somebody else. Eugene, um, I can hear your voice. You might have something off mute. Somebody has an open mic, I think. Oh, oh let me turn on. Yeah, I had my phone on, so let me. Okay. okay. Sorry. So you can go to the next slide, Eugene. Uh, Is that better? Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, it's going. Um, okay. Oops. So that's a picture of the rock and the, and some ore. Uh, and you can see the mines. It's got a very hexagonal look in some of the veins of basalt. And then the bottom right are some of the chopped fibers that we make from it. Um, there are long continuous strands basically pulled and then woven onto bobbins, just like I, I said. Next, the, uh, just recently, um, we have our rebuilder has been ACI 440 code approved, ICC certified to all the ASTM specifications. Um, our rebar is two to three times stronger in tension than steel and 70% lighter. It's about a 25% higher flexural modulus than fiberglass, and it's 10 times better electrical insulator than fiberglass. Fiberglass is a good electrical insulator, but uh, basalt has been shown to be an order of magnitude better. Uh, it's UV immune, it's safe, inert, and non-respirable. Of course, if you're grinding and sanding it, you would still wear a mask, um, and it takes impact better. Um, so in a composite, uh, like a wall panel or, or even something um, for ballistics, it, it's great at impact and has far better acid, salt, and chemical resistance than fiberglass. Uh, it doesn't shatter like carbon fibers and is much nicer to work with and costs far less than carbon. It does not conduct electricity like carbon and it doesn't harbor bacterial or microbial growth and it can take hundreds of degrees hotter and colder temperatures than fiberglass. Uh, and it's eco-friendly and easily recyclable, and it's all natural rock fiber. Next. Oh, sorry. Next slide, Eugene. Yep, yep. there we go. Let's see, we've got, uh, so it's the most readily available rock on the planet, but like I said, you know, only certain results qualify to be made by this. Um, it's far superior to steel and stronger and lighter and longer lasting with its non-corrosive properties. Um, it's got a much lower carbon footprint, about 67% better than steel, um, and or 74% better than steel and a concrete reduction, and a hundred plus year, I would say hundreds of years actually lifespan. Um, being rock uh, when put in concrete, it expands and contracts at the same rate as your concrete, unlike other steel and other product. Um, it, Pollute, it's produced at below cost parity to steel, and we can put it in a container. I can ship four containers worth of basalt, um, for the, the equal of four containers of steel and one container of basalt, saving over 30000 in shipping costs to begin. Um, and so we have numerous national and international bodies of certified basalt building materials. Next. I thought I'd have a couple questions for you, Nick. Okay, go ahead. Where where are these generally located, and how do they mine them? So where are these deposits, or whatever you would call them? Are they near volcanic? Uh, um, uh, yeah, um, some are actually sands that are on on ground surface, and some are mined, um, mostly at uh, not deep levels. Uh, but there's we probably got five or six that we've assayed around the world that we're working with now. Uh, originally, um, 
Ukraine and Russia produced most of the qualified basalts. China has some in Vietnam and uh, uh, Uzbekistan, but um, we have a few mines located uh, in around the United States that we're we're looking at. Okay, and then my next question is: so, so you say that some aren't qualified because they're they have impurities in them. Is there any way to refine it or purify it? Or is yeah, that just oh yeah, uh, right. Yes, yeah, with better melt uh, with better melt technology which we're also working on to do higher temperatures so you can deal with the uh, variables. Um, but in general, you want to start with the right properties. Okay. Not, but you could, you know, you could actually too. cook it high enough or heat it, heat it to a high enough temperature that it would take out the impurities? Yeah. Well, yeah, it becomes more of an amorphous filament with the right control so rather than having any crystalline impurities. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions before we go on to the next slide? Well, we've got a pause. You made a point of saying non-respirable. I'm assuming you're worried about the an analogy to asbestos. Yes, it, it, we originally uh, we actually invented the basalt back there in the 50s and dropped it and went with asbestos of all things. Um, but the Russians picked it up and perfected it and, and it became a military secret and they hid it for a few decades uh, because of all of its properties for RF frequencies, stealth, impact, and et cetera. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, like I said, I mean, it's, it's basic, uh, size is considered a little bigger than being respirable, but if you're sanding or grinding it, of course you would wear mask and protection for uh, not inhaling it. Okay. And you mentioned that the, it's in, basically instantly recyclable, but the recycling process is going to be something similar to glass, correct? Grind up and remelt. Actually, actually, actually far better because glass, uh, has to have uh, chemical uh, reactions to extract it from most of the like the epoxy or vinyl esters and whatnot. But um, I've been working particularly with uh, looking at bio-based resins now and, and thermoplastics that you can combine with basalt and at the end of life, you make something else out of it. So a, a more fully circular uh, sustainable solution. Okay, there's another question. Uh, from from Stan, you want to go ahead and, and unmute and ask your question, Stan? Yeah, just curious. I don't. Know, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just curious as to how um, once a panel is made out of out of basalt. So, like a you mentioned fiberglass, and let's say you're making a hole of a, a, a boat or something. How yeah. taxable yeah. would a panel of basalt be to uh, in austere environments? Could they do it, or would it have to go back to a special um, you know, repair site or something to do. Are you asking if you can spray it yourself? Well, I mean, so fiberglass is, is kind of ubiquitous, right? If, if you crack it, yeah, you need to fix it, but anybody can go in and, and patch a fiberglass hole. Um, would the same be true, or could the same be true for basalt? Well, actually, we've had a bunch of skiffs made in the last few years and a couple large fishing vessels, and down in the Keys, the reason they're loving the basalt is they run up on rocks and things a lot, and it doesn't poke a hole easily like it does in the glass. And um, actually, if you have a gel coat and you get a blister in it, it doesn't suck up water like glass into the core. So it takes impact far better and is uh, easily repa repairable. It costs five times or more less than carbon. If you look okay. on my blog, if you look on my blog, it's the Basalt Guru blog. There's pictures of boats. Um, you know, skips you can put, down in the key. <laughs> you can put that in the chat. Okay. That'd be, that'd be great. Um, so, Sunil, go ahead. You have a, a question about hypersonics and temperatures. Yeah. What temperatures uh, can this be used in hypersonics, for instance? Very high temperatures. Yeah. We're about a few hundred degrees hotter capable than uh, than fiberglass. Um, thermal sustained operating temperatures can be over 600 degrees centigrade. Okay, so nothing like 3,000 degrees. But we also, or... yeah, but I also have yeah. coatings and, and resins that are, uh, because I'm a small company, I align myself with people who do like ballistic nose cones, uh, high temperature coatings and uh, siloxanes and silazanes and nano ceramics and things of that nature. So we have those as well, um, and uh, non-toxic uh, epoxy that I have now that's completely non-toxic, bizet-free, unique new additive uh, to go with the basalt as well. 
Yeah, like silicon carbide, you you can go up to twelve hundred degrees centigrade. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's quite if, with quite the right resins. Easy. If you put yeah with the right resins, and if you put it into an autoclave, uh, we can be over three thousand. Okay, thank you. So jumping in on that thought, you mentioned earlier that some of the mines are not certified because of contaminants. Can you deliberately dope the material with different compounds if you wanted to change some of its properties? Yeah, yeah, you can do surface modifications. You can dope and, and the sizing that are sprayed on there, the silanes, and and those are all made to be compatible with. Like if you're going to put it into concrete, or you're going to put it into uh, thermoset or thermoplastic, and each, each one of those silanes is different according to what you want it to be compatible with. I was thinking more about the chemistry of the actual melt process when you're actually producing the fibers. If you could, does it tolerate? chemical additives that would the, be integral, not just sprayed on? It can be, yes. I'm not an expert in, in all of that melt viscosity or what you can or cannot add, but um, you can do things like uh, they add uh, zirconium and stuff to alkaline resistant fiberglass to give it certain properties. So yeah, that, that can be done. Okay, to completely defeat one of its selling point properties, can it be made conductive? I've actually sprayed it with graphite, you know, graphene sprays and, and made it conductive. Yep. I'm, and, I'm done here. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah, I see your your link in your blog in the chat. Thanks. Yes. All right. Any more questions before we move on? I know there have been a few people that have that have come in during all this Q&A. Uh, anybody that, that has come in new, have any questions, want any updates? All right. Okay. I will cha change to the next. Slide, go ahead, Nick. Okay, so basalt, it's obviously, it's got a much longer life cycle um, when we're putting it in things like uh, concrete, if, if with the right types of concretes that we work with, either geopolymers or high performance, or ultra high performance concretes. Uh, we make macro fiber rebars as well now. They're like toothpick size rebars that you don't get rid of welded wire mesh um, and sometimes rebar completely. Um, making it much more cost effective, uh, safe and recyclable. It's much stronger in tension. It's far 70% lighter. Um, it's saving uh, from corrosion and cracking. You know, cracks are pretty ubiquitous in concrete and we can reduce that significantly. Uh, it's very easy to handle. We can make coils of rebars up to 10 millimeter that are hundreds of meters long that I can pick up with one hand. And we can put it into mines and tunnels and shock creating and precast and uh, you know, and you name it uh, concrete reinforcements. Um, and it can be actually tied to steel. There's no rule that says you only have to have one or the other. So you can actually combine it in some places in, uh, with steel. We never we didn't used to make corner bends and everything, but now we have a bending machine. We can actually make stirrups and corners and profiles so you can actually form it then yes sir normally you don't bend an frp in the field you have to do that at the factory okay no we have a bending machine for that <laughs> so do, you, do you have a piece handy yes sir wait how do i let up <laughs> can you see a piece of rebar right there can you see that yeah and it's either, when we make it all different thicknesses as well too this is even going to be but it then see how it comes back like a like a fishing pole or pole ball. I mean, you can bend it and it snaps back to straight. Got a great memory. Well, if I bent a piece of steel like that, that steel which is really strong to bend it to that point. But once you bend it that far, it stays bent. But the basalt is going to return. You you compared that to like a fishing pole or something. How how would that compare directly to like a fiberglass fishing pole? Would that be cost functional? Would there be a market for that? High end market. It costs more than regular fiberglass, less than carbon. Some people make carbon, um, but we put it into sporting goods like uh, rods and all, puts it in skis, and Wilson puts it in tennis rackets. One woman, Emma Roddick, Radicanu, who in Wimbledon, uh, has a basalt graphite tennis racket, and she won the US Open with that last, last summer. Nice. We make surfboards and skis and snowboards, and they love that flexural module because it's not as stiff as carbon and not as soft as fiberglass. We make uh, prosthetics and cryogenics and 
basically you name it, it can handle hundreds of degrees colder than other fibers. It actually can be used in uh, in filament winding for things like hydrogen or liquid natural gas storage, better than carbon. Okay, so that hits an interesting one. Um, Elon Musk's Starship, they bragged about how they use stainless steel because uh, carbon fiber is stronger at Earth temperatures, but in space it's actually far weaker at the cryogenic temperatures. You've got a material that handles cryogenic temperatures, is lighter than steel and comparable in strength to carbon. Is there a space market for yeah, this now? Right. Yeah, that's right. And you might be able to wrap around this steel as well. They do that with carbon as well, too. But the basalt actually proved exactly what you said, that it has a better uh, coefficient of expansion at those cryogenic temperatures. All right. So um, Nick Matthew has a question about fabrics. Go fabrics, ahead, Matthew. yes. Go ahead, Matthew. Can you unmute Matthew? I'm not hearing you. So he's asking if there are any fabrics for FRP commercially available. With fabrics, we make we make all kinds of we uh, we have unidirectionals, uh, biaxial, triaxial quads. We have twills, uh, satins, surface veils, sleeves, all, all kinds of fabric. And Nick, Nick, where would one buy these? Uh, through, through my web, through go to my website. Just type in basalt-fabric.com. Yeah, they'll, repeat they'll, that. Sorry, it'll be at the end of the presentation. All right, thank and you. you can you can and you can always email me, and I can send you Nick's information. Brilliant, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, and I think somebody earlier was it Sunil? Somebody was on asked about fabrics and weaving, and uh, but yes, we we've had people make things like uh, fireman jackets and stuff, and with the right coatings on there that you can put like those siloxanes I was telling you about, you can lock up the fiber so they're not itching, give it even higher temperature resistance, and and it's got great abrasion properties. It, it blows away fiberglass for abrasion abrasion properties. When you also have the that insulation that that you showed me that that's very thin and very. That's a, a thermal that's a, a aerogel product. Yeah, the aerogel. So basically, yeah. Uh, yeah, hold on a second. I'll show you that. Uh, All right. Uh, is, is is he talking about a like a hybrid between aerogel and basalt? So the insulation of, of aerogel and the strength of basalt. Yeah. Well. Well, actually, what we would do is we would laminate uh, layers of like a basalt fabric with a layer of this uh, aerogel. See this aerogel fabric? This is uh, one that's made for clothing, etc. We have another version that's uh, used by NASA. Um, hold on, let's go and see through this one. This is uh, completely non burning, it's only two millimeters thick, right? used by NASA, where you wind this in between uh, like batteries to stop thermal runaway. So it's completely fireproof, pretty much, and uh, the best thermal insulation on the planet for its thickness. There's two millimeters of this is worth over an inch and a half of polyiso foam in K value. So we, we put it into the flexible material so that you can put it in uh, dive suits, wetsuits, uh, Arctic gear, and you can climbing jackets and whatnot, um, but you can line uh, an automotive, a car, or a jet, or whatever. You know, put this under your headliner, and you get an incredible thermal insulation. I have a video uh, I can put out that shows a guy picking up a piece of dry ice with his bare hand, with this material in his bare hand. Oh my gosh! Yeah. But well, you have the other one that you that you ran a torch on too. Yeah, that's right. We have an E94 vertical burn test on the torch on the the white one I showed you with no burn happening. We've also put that aerogel and ceramics into a waterproof paint that goes on like this is a piece of aluminum with the aerogel enhanced waterproof coating on, on it. Aerogel is the most insulating thing on the planet next to a vacuum. It's not the least expensive stuff <laughs> in the world, but it's the best. So um so now what what about antimicrobial and that kind of stuff? And like, would it would it yes. keep keep? Would it, is it anti fouling for marine applications or anything like that? The salt doesn't harbor bacterial or microbial growth, so it's fantastic for that. Yes, and again, we have the right coatings and uh, resins to go with it where needed. Okay. Now, to so Eugene's Jeremy, point, has it has it been studied for resistance to uh, marine fouling? Uh, I don't know the right term for uh, 
barnacles and other things that love to attach onto hulls and ruin their hydrodynamics. Well, we have we have a coating that that's made for that. that yes, so it's a very clear. It goes on like water, phenylalanine, uh, polysilazine that would would work. It worked for that. They actually put it on the Americans Cup boat some years ago, and Oracle did. Okay. All right. So let's move on. Next slide. Next. Um, can you can you okay, shrink we, that one a little bit? Can I, I shrink it? Uh, I'm kind of overfilling in my screen here. I can't read it. <laughs> okay. So but anyhow, it's uh, go ahead. You were talking about this already. It said you know oh, right, right, yeah. and but, Wilson uses it for tennis rackets. Rosing oh, golf right. for surfboards. Anybody mm -hmm. doing it with golf clubs? No, carbon is still the lightest uh, fiber that that there is. Um, on a cheaper uh, golf club, you certainly could. Um, or hockey stick could could be a good application for it. Okay. Wouldn't shatter like the carbon that they're using now. Uh, can you talk a little bit about a prosthetics? The prosthetics. Uh, we have a whole line. For a company called Coyote that uses basalt extensively. Um, we have a sleeve material. It's kind of like that Chinese finger sleeve. It feeds here. My hold on. This is uh, this uh, sleeve material. It's actually open um, on one end. You can kind of see where it looks down inside of it. But this is all different thicknesses or uh, diameters of this, and it'll conform to wrap around. Uh, a pipe or mandrel or whatever you want it to go around. Um, and it's a beautiful golden color, basalt fiber fabrics in and of themselves. I don't know if you can see that golden color, but it's, it's quite nice and uh, incredibly durable. So yeah, you could put that uh, material around all kinds of things and make incredibly strong uh, holes, pipes. Uh, we're making pipeline on, pipes out of it, uh, liners for pipes. Um, Water lines, gas lines, oil, oil or gas lines it would be fantastic with basalt. I right, so go ahead, Willis. You had another question. Yeah, I was just curious how it responded to uh, RF waves. Uh, you know, does it absorb, reflect? Uh, transparent. Uh, that's that's uh, it's actually transparent RF frequency. That's one of the reasons that Russians kept it a secret for their stealth planes. It'd be great, uh, and, uh, radar, radomes. Yeah, well, you. you're 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 working with. Um, have you been talking with with Bill Goodman from uh, at all? I know I put you guys no, together. Um, okay. um, not 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 recently. Yeah, but okay. I'd be happy to speak with anybody looking to try it, trial it for that. Yeah, because one of the things that um that Goodman Technologies does and and his uh his presentations up on our YouTube channel is he he does composites and mm. uh, you know mm -hmm. the the idea was to put him and nick together because one he he actually does some some aligning with the chemical structures of the uh of the the materials to actually make them super conductive for rf where it, it'll it'll just absorb it all so mm. Mm, but also he does, he, he does heat shield he does heat shields for the for the craft that are entering into the atmosphere and stuff like that and so that's why the yeah. two of you need to be talking right, right. But, yeah some of the ceramics go higher temps and they're probably using ceramics and carbon for some of that even though they're really expensive <laughs> yeah okay go ahead jeremy when, so yeah as we're thinking about all the different things that this compares to uh, I'm curious, uh, carbon fiber is really strong, but it's not used in body armor because it's too fragile. It shatters when it gets hit by a high velocity object. Uh, yeah. I'm familiar with HDP, high density polyethylene, the, the lighter mm -hmm. class of, of body armor that's supposedly rifle rated. I'm curious if you've ever thought of either comparing to or an, an additive process with HDPE to see if you could achieve lightweight uh, body armor. Yes, absolutely. We're actually in that process now. And we're having that testing done. I've done it in the past with the, it was a uh, Okinawan Navy. They ended up using that as like a Dyneema panel with a basalt on it for their, their vessels. Um, and we had, you know, the five shot test done and everything and it worked fantastic for that, but I haven't done it recently, but we're doing the body armor test soon with a company down in Florida. 
Do you know what their base material is? Is it uh, denim? Is it like the denim? Is I, if I remember correctly, is a Kevlar competitor. It's a, it's a more modern fiber than Kevlar, but it's the same concept. Same kind of concept. I'm saying they'll put like the kind of plastic like layers in between the, the layers that help in that absorption. But, um, but I'm not. Uh, I don't know exactly what the materials are that they're, they're using in the interlaminar structure. Yeah, I'll put you guys together afterwards, and I mean. We we can have all those discussions. Yeah, we've actually used the basalt with that aerogel for um, putting on like a, a muzzle uh, for holding on to a, a gun because they couldn't handle the temperatures. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, so it worked great for that with that aerogel in the middle. They almost labor on a suppressor as well to to top the to knock back the heat bloom. So. Yeah. You can actually manage to hold on to it. You can hold on to it with after hundreds of rounds and not burn out. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and move on to the next. Mm -hmm. Just pictures of. Uh, in my opinion, I've been working with some companies um, who do some basically their three D printing um, of core um, strengths, and uh, they sometimes they'll like do a, a something you'd be hard pressed to ever make of uh, like a veneer panel on a high rise building um, out of a, that kind of shape out of. Uh, regular form, but with 3D printing, you can make that and fill it with foam or, or concrete and put our, our specialty concretes and or basalts on that veneer. So um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for that combination uh, for buildings of the future to make them more insulating and fireproof and lightweight. So instead of a big giant heavy piece of concrete or stone, you basically you can 3, 3D print your core structure and fill it with the right, again, fire retardant insulated materials with, with our materials on it. And then you've got the building veneers of the future or even the actual structure. Now, do you have basalt filaments available for 3D printing? Yes, we do. Yep. And you can put it into the thermoplastics as well, too. The long strands can be put right into that. That's that they make. Okay. So um, go to market. Steel's characteristics are uh, small scale adoption over the centuries. Every village had a blacksmith and smaller foundries grew. And then bas basalt cannot be scaled similarly, but it requires high volume and consistent quality, both of which involve front cost, which we're working on building uh, more facilities um, around the world right now. Um, steel is dominant right now, and we hope to get a, you know, some percentage of the steel market with basalt to be cost effective and uh, it's got to be produced and adopted at scale. But we're working on that and making some good headway and people finally recognizing the sustainability and longevity of something, you know, steel is rusting and corroding all over the United States and the Caribbean everywhere, basically, and having to replace you know, literally billions of dollars of bridges that have to be replaced now because of the use of steel and concrete, where we can get hundreds and hundreds of years better, longer lasting uh, sustainability with basalt in the right mix. Next, mines okay, and mines. tunnels. Hard to see that, but we've used it in uh, some water lines and uh, water uh, treatment tunnels. Um, basalt doesn't corrode to the uh, basically, there are these um, uh, corrosive uh, chemistry and, and wastewater treatment that eats through concrete and steel, and uh, basalt doesn't get uh, eaten by that bacteria. So, we've done some long term studies with it and Again, putting like whole coils and or uh, meshes and stuff in mines and tunnels that can be shot created. They, they'll be far easier to implement, to bend, put into place, and last decades longer. So, so what about um, what about hardware? Bolts, nuts? Is is that a possibility or or no? It, it, it could be done with the, with the right thermoplastic mixes. We, we're getting anywhere from. Well, 100 to 200 percent stronger thermoplastics by adding salt strands into the into those thermoplastics. Yeah, I'm thinking, you know, with marine applications mm -hmm. rather than using what we have now. It can be done, but, but you know, everything is a cost in development and testing yeah. cycle. <laughs> 
every time you turn around, there's another hundred thousand dollars worth of casting. But, but yeah, it certainly could be done. We do have like a bolt thing that they use now. It's like an expansion bolt that they put in mines and tunnels, and it's got like a big housing around the end of it, and uh, and that goes in and it locks down like the geo grid that you'll put into a, a tunnel. Okay. All right. So there's a couple questions, Jeremy. If you want to go first. Oh, so well, you were mentioning uh, things you can re steal, things that you can replace. Um, I was curious how this functions as a woven cable, like a suspension bridge cable. It you you it certainly could be, and it would be thousands of pounds lighter. But you'd have to put like some kind of a, a rubbery, compounded plastic uh, wrap on that, you know, in order to encapsulate it. That that could that could definitely be done too with the right encapsulation. I'm just looking at like yeah. just, just, the suspension bridge is a huge part of the load that they have to carry is the cabling itself. Right. Yeah. Curious how, how this you compares. Can't, you, yeah, it's a different uh, pre-stressing or post-stressing technology. You don't can't use the amount of pre-stressing that they do with steel, but because it's already two, three times stronger in tension, it's a different equation. But that that certainly can be done. Um, you can wrap it around fiber optic lines for insulation, or high tension lines would be a great one. And then actually, while I was waiting to bug you with that question, another one occurred to me. Are you familiar with a material called foamed glass? Yes, sir. The, aero, so one, one of the, aero aggregates. Yeah, one of the, the features of that is they tend to make it in like fill gravel because unless you keep it in a kiln and slowly cool it, as it's cooling, it shatters. I'm curious if some of the properties of your material would let you make a foamed basalt that wouldn't shatter as it's cooling because of its intrinsic properties, and you could actually make 3D structured in out of that material. Mm -hmm. Good question. I don't know, but it, it sounds great. <laughs> I'd like to see I'm, it. I'm full of questions, no answers. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Um, Willis, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious. Uh, you mentioned earlier about uh, where the where this material is located in the countries in China and Russia, a couple of them that you mentioned. And I guess my mm -hmm. question is, you know, because of the location there, does it limit the commercial viability because of the difficulty getting in, getting, you know, material out to those, from those countries and things of that nature? Over? Uh, actually, we're in the middle of uh, developing a new fiber facility in the United States. It's a big fundraising event, as you could tell. Um, we have friends who just built a brand new 12 furnace facility in the UAE. We have, have partners with the Uzbekistan group. Um, and so we have um, fiber opportunity from around the world, but we are working on building more for the, in the US. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, so now on your slide here, you have things like conveyors, filtration, high temperature. Mm -hmm. So now where would those, where would you see high temperature filtration requirements? Um, any any uh, factory furnace facility that is emitting high temperature. Oh, okay, you're talking about like particulate. Yeah. Okay. All right, so you're talking yeah. about like particulate filters and uh, you know carbon yeah. capture and that kind of stuff. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. But but it can also come down to medical grade uh, filtration as well, and uh, you know algaes and, and smaller microns of you know other medical filtration because you know again it doesn't harbor any of that bacterial or microbial growth and uh, it's pretty immune to a lot of that okay so i'm open uh, that if some of you guys have some particular interests we can work together in uh, whether it's construction water treatment maintenance uh commercial federal department of defense r d services uh, we have testing facilities uh, and Verifications. I have a crater with the Navy. We, we get testing done with them. We're working on putting advanced sizings and graphenes and things on our fabrics. Um, it again it can be used for ballistics and impact. Um, you, I personally think you could lightweight a truck with this, and it would be far better uh, impact resistant than uh, any anything pretty much that they're using now. Um, I, you could make leaf springs out of it that would probably reduce the weight of a vehicle by a, a thousand pounds. 
uh, all, all kinds of opportunity for it. Okay. Yeah, so anybody has a creative thought, want to reach out to us, we'll be happy to uh, engage and see what we can make happen. Yeah, so really, I mean, the, the best thing that the community can do is network your solution within their within their communities and their organizations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, because I, I mean, because like we said at the beginning, the applications are just so broad that um, you know you, you can't even begin to to imagine all the applications for this. Right. Yeah. But you know, it, it, again, with its inherent properties being you know superior in many ways to both the glass or, or carbon, and uh, I think there's um, obviously a lot of avenues to, that you can go down and. Uh, Find a superior final product. But has there been any anybody looked into um, using this as a uh, replacement for like FR4 for circuit boards and stuff like that? Uh, we talked about it, and I guess there are some new glasses that are, that are made out there that are supposed to be really great for that. But um, it, you know, being a ten times better electrical insulator, um, I don't believe it could be. Okay. Yeah. But uh, thank everybody for your time and hopefully um, we'll make some projects. So then, um, you know, talking to the community, the people that are here, what would be the next best application that we should address? Aerospace, marine? Marine would be a really good one, actually. Uh, with uh, a sustainable, with the sustainable resins, like I said, I mean, you know, you'd have a boat hull today. That doesn't take impact nearly as well. At the end of its life, you got to pay to get rid of it now. <laughs> so why wouldn't you have something that literally could be melted, ground up, and made into something else? <laughs> yeah. So so Stan chimed in and said Marine. So yeah. So we'll, we'll just we can do that. We could we could do a whole presentation around around marine applications. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, some people talk about robotics that Cleve I was showing you has been made in uh, with um, soft uh, inflatable robotic arms that basically uh, you can put water or air into them and actually make an in inflatable robotic arms in essence. <laughs> okay, and someone someone had asked. Uh, let's see if I can scan through the chat here. Someone was asking a brought up. Uh, aerospace applications. I don't know if that was Jeremy. It was me. It was me. I, w I remember reading about how Elon Musk built his starship out of steel and people were freaked out because why don't you use carbon fiber? And he pointed out that at cryogenic temperatures in space, stainless steel is actually stronger than carbon fiber because it gains yeah. strength by cooling, whereas, whereas carbon fiber becomes fragile, so they'd have to use so much more. And as mm -hmm. soon as you listed the cryogenic properties of this material, I my immediate thought was, well, that might change the equation on, on strength versus weight. Yeah. Yeah, they might have an issue with using it externally or internally. That I don't think it should be a problem. Or like I said, on a hydrogen storage tank or something like that. But um, externally, as a skin, they might have issues. All right. So, um, so Rich, you're on. You're on the call. You're from from AFRL. Do you have any connections? Um, I mean, I I work with Howard Meyer closely. I don't know if you know Howard. He's at the Pentagon. If you're there, Rich. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not getting an answer. Okay, well, yeah, I'll check with uh, with with my contacts at Air. Okay, anybody <laughs> well, anybody got okay. a contact at Blue Origin? <laughs> Actually, um, I was talking to to Nick earlier about a salt reactor to power. He's actually. Are you ready, Rich? So, so yeah. So anyway, I got contacts that would have application composite. Yeah. Uh, one one of the composite companies already has a composite that space or micro five seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour is orbital velocity. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So so yeah. So it can it can withstand a micrometeor what they're what they're putting into it. But I've been trying to get them on to. Oh, they actually have something that can handle that. Um, so one of the interesting documents on the salt fiber in radiation and all other fibers when subjected to high levels of radiation, be it, you know, gamma, others, lose significant mechanical strength. The salt, for some strange reason, actually gained. Brings a whole new meaning to rad hardening. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's funny because one, now one of the questions that, that has come up and one of the topics that, that I've been asked, the federal organ chip design, and that's that's their... Mm. 
Yeah, well, you know, you mentioned on the uh, circuit boards earlier, I mean, for specialty applications, um, when you're going again into those cryogenic temperatures on, on an alcohol that actually gets in some of the uh, satellites and whatnot, but the basalt can handle those temperatures far better than any other. Yeah, well, well, some of them aren't just the static temperature swings that they have, to, especially mm -hmm. especially the anything that's in EO or MEO that is mm -hmm. going to be night and day. Right. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned uh, the material gets harder, gets a strength there. I'm, I'm, I don't know about any more brittle. What about red shielding compared to other materials of the same weight? You said it's transparent to RF. How does it yes. handle other types of radiation that function as shielding is all, or is it mostly transparent it's, to? It's, it's been used in shielding, but with other things, like, like we've used it with a uh, specialty geopolymer cement mix. It worked, worked effectively for that. I don't know about by itself. So you would know if it would, how it would. It has been used for in a, in a shielding assembly. All right, Rich, are you with us? Can you talk? Yes, I am finally. How am I coming in? Good, good. Good, 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 good. Great. Appreciate that. I have uh, issues with our laptop based on uh, classification oh, to yeah, and from home. So, yeah, 100%. So, yes, uh, to answer your question. Yes, Eugene, thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, ben Corelli. Uh, lots of things run through my mind. <laughs> thank you. There you go. Gotcha. Thank um, you. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah, if you could share uh, it. So, <clears throat> a lot of things came to mind, especially when you started getting into the concrete, uh, specifically hardened, deeply buried targets. Um, a lot of applications that I see that are possibilities. Somebody brought up hypersonics. Um, I also think, uh, so to, uh, Eugene, to go back to um, Howard Myers, he's a good point of contact. Um, support contractor for um, FRLRW for the munitions directorate, uh, three mission area lead, global precision, precision attack, air superiority, and uh, soft PR. So um, uh, Nick, you were talking about the uh, the woven uh, with the ballistic uh, vest. So that yeah, that's an applicability too. So I think there's a lot of things that could possibly be done. In fact, I think it's kind of a hidden gem. If uh, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know you, the Aquatic laser or not laser, the uh, layers. Um, there's, yeah, so for sure. Um, Eugene, so definitely Howard Mars. I'll shoot you my email. I'll put my email address in there and then uh, I'll be able to push Great. you guys to the uh, missionary leads and uh, find some applicability. Great. We have a lot here oh, yeah. the munitions yeah. director. Yeah. We kind of yeah. span out it's over all the direct. Uh -huh. Good, go ahead. One thing I forgot to tell you um, about this aerogel, correctable fabric we're putting in clothing and things. Um, I'd like to see it be put into like a poncho or sleeping bag um, because if you get fiberglass or down, they're no good. If you compress them, they're no good. This stuff doesn't matter. It's hydrophobic. You get it wet. It doesn't affect it. You can compress it. It doesn't affect it. It weighs nothing. But we have a, um, we had a guy hold a piece of it over half of his body and took a drone with air heat signature and the half of his body with this fabric underneath it could not be seen by the IR, IR gun. So it would be fantastic wow. for, yeah. Right. That's perfect. Too, is oh, that's another special avenue operations. for the uh, deception. Yeah, the deception, mm -hmm. uh, the covering for tactics. So yeah, that's that's an absolute side of it, 100%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, it, it, you know, you could make a fabric with a basalt and or whatever that inside of it, and you could throw it over uh, a vehicle trying to hide that heat signature or, or a tent or, or humans whatever because i know the particularly the russians are using those to pick up a lot of the ukrainians now and in my opinion uh, they need something and we all need something that actually works and is quick to implement i mean sometimes i've been trying to show this and get it like i've been to natick and places and they take forever in a day and they don't can't sometimes it's just discouraging to me when people's lives are at stake that we can't move things fast enough and it would only take you like two hours to literally to prove this you know either it works or it doesn't there you go you know put it put a gun on it do a heat you know all this is made for nasa the numbers of its k value are are all available so it's not like you have to reinvent the wheel and take two years of study to verify this yeah i think uh that's a great point and i think uh before or prior to the meeting eugene brought it up and said that you know the government it no faster than slow and that's a true statement so it, I, I understand it can be very uh frustrating 
Um, mm-hmm. But well, you know, it, to go it, back to your point, it can be rich. But you know, that's one of the things that we've been we've been able about through, the through this forum to get things sped up. Yeah, either through shibbers sure. or you know, I've actually when I was working with government, we actually identified a venture capital that fund further develop product while the federal government was developing the requirement and their contract, and mm-hmm. so yeah. we put that together to allow that to that's right. So, so, mm-hmm. so we do have, have I mean, within this form of capitalism, they anonymous mm-hmm. as yeah. such, and, and there are there are also you know, several R and D and as mm-hmm. provide me with. Cool. Well, I I will say that you know I I work directly for the federal government, but I don't for the federal government, so um, I'll put <laughs> I'll put that there in the stand, and then uh, I I'm interested. I'm really curious. You know, this happened to tune in on the calendar. This has a yeah. lot of applications. Um, uh, I know, and, and Eugene, go ahead. And yeah. Mehmet, Mehmet came in just uh-huh. recently to talk with Mehmet. Mehmet needs to talk with you, but Mehmet can understand the value, of some benefits. And but, it, it but yeah, close so, the Mehmet, if you're listening, you, you need to talk to Rick. There's application. Hi, everybody, and uh, Eugene. I'm not clear who was talking. Oh, Rich from AFRL. Okay, I got. Yes. It. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, all. and and also I think. I think Nick. I think there might. We can't discuss them here. That okay. is mostly unclassified projects, so okay. so not through the itself, but still providing okay. all this. But I can I can see some of the stuff that he does would be great. I appreciate it. That's very very productive. Thank you all. And it, Rich, were you going to put your email in the in the chat? I don't see. I it. thought I did. Go back and oh, there uh, it is. Double tap it. I'm, okay, gotcha. Thanks. Hey, thanks a lot, Nick. That was awesome. Thank. You. Thank you all. Bye bye. Right, so anybody, anything else before we go? All right, thank you um, aerospace. I don't thank see you Rich's. For... I don't see Rich's email, so I'll put. Yeah, mine no, it's in just kind of spinning right now. I mean, I can see it where. You put oh, I see in dots going, but nothing is coming through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't finish typing it out. So a lack of coffee. Here, here's I, mine. I, I'm actually on the web. Well, hey, thanks for joining. Us. Are you at you at Kirkland or? Oh uh, no, I'm at uh at uh Fort Walton Beach, Niceville oh. area. Hey, uh, Rich, right. <clears throat> I got a question for you. I, mean, I, I mentioned something in the chat. Uh, it wasn't April. I saw that. Uh, it was Space Force that did Pitch Day a couple times. I don't know if they still do it or not. I I worked on a project that did some of the the background check and supply chain check for the people doing pitches on uh, on okay. Pitch Day. I'm curious if AFRL okay. does something like that, or if instead of something like that, they could link into a forum like this. Yeah, I, I'm 100% positive, and there's um, there are close to seven missionary leads. I just I just remember doing the, the uh, supply chain checks, of, um, the background checks for each day, yeah. and like the mix of really okay. high quality stuff and total crackpots. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> standard, right? Yeah, it, it wasn't too bad, but there were one or two really good standouts, like the self-declared leader of a Native American nation that didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm tracking. 100. Yeah, so my email's in there. You guys go ahead and hit yep. me up, and I'll try to uh, make a dot-to-dot connection. And, yeah. No promises, you know how that goes. So, but you yeah. Know. Well, I mean, my my day tomorrow is. Uh, it's merit in it, Hunter. My day tomorrow is in touch, and if you don't get in touch, then you need to hear from me. Nice persistence. I love it. Wait, well, you gotta, you got to. I mean, I, right. believe me, I've been on both. I've been on both sides. I've been, I've been a contractor, and and I and I understand. I understand. dictate your priority for you. You can't always follow up to follow up continue to be interested and, and, and as a contractor fine line between mm-hmm. diligent and being and, yeah and they're so overzealous that, and then they're wrong gotcha yeah oh, exactly and, and that's kind of what we want to do and, and roles that we play is that reach out to me you know okay. and i'll i'll ping from an agency and say hey you know that way i uh, think it protects right. their relationship you yep. know and people like you if, if i if i upset you. oh i do and i've got tough skin I, I what i say is a minimum <laughs> i'd like to uh get you and uh and and nick and then have have a talk with my missionary leads and however they you know, just to kind of maybe recapture it without you know the agony of another hour or so plus but uh, maybe send the pre uh pre-read slides and yeah. uh, we can have you know probably like 15 30 minute or however long just block an hour out and then go from there so i've uh, well, that works. i've made the bridge mend yeah I've, i'm yeah, i'm all about minimizing the presentations would be all sus- yeah we get a lot of that in afl lots of briefings lots of talk gotcha okay Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thanks, Jeremy. Everyone else, for, before we go, Phyllis, also thank you for your comments. And again, everybody that, that commented to say, please email in the chat if I don't have it. And um, everybody have a good day, good week. I hope everybody had a good fourth. See you next week. See you guys later.